right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pensive Politics, Mr. Watson. I am your host, Christian Watson. With me today, I have someone who I think is perhaps one of the most important voices in America, Lily Tang Williams, who is, I'll let her describe herself to you in a moment, but I am just incredibly honored to have her on the show. I am incredibly honored to be able to talk about, talk, talk with her about her experiences dealing with Marxism in her home country of China and then seeing it take manifest hold in America. And I'm just very happy that we have the privileges in this country, in America, to have an honest and open conversation about these things. Whereas in many other countries, there are human beings who live with their voices stifled under the boot of a tyrant. And so this conversation is much more than simply a political conversation. This conversation is a tribute to everyone in China, everyone in any country around the world, whether it's in Africa or wherever, who are suffering from having a mute voice because their government don't want to let them be free thinkers. So uh, Lily, how are you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. That was a wonderful um, you know, beginning and uh, you are right. I'm not just speaking for myself. I feel like I have a duty to speak for the voiceless people in the world, and including there are lots of them still in today's China. They don't have a voice like I do. So I feel like I'm on a mission. Oh yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm happy to support you in that mission. So Lily, before we get into everything, just tell us, you know, tell viewers about who you are, tell them, you know, how you kind of got started on your journey and just, you know, why you're doing what you do. Cause I think that it is so vitally important that people know that because what you were doing in my opinion is very valuable. Thank you for people who don't know me. I was born and grew up in Chengdu, Sichuan province of the People's Republic of China. After I was born, two years later, Mao's great proletarian cultural revolution happened in China. I was born into a working class family with both parents were basically illiterate workers. So, in people's mind, if you live under communism and you were born to the, you know, literate, illiterate working poor family, you should be the rulers, right? Because workers rule, right? According to communism and Marxism. No, we were not rulers at all. To describe that uh, the um, community housing we left as of eight families shared one bathroom and one water faucet and the primitive condition of this bathroom it will make you sick to think about it it's a big giant you go giant hole on the ground and you have to squat and divide them in the middle by uh, just the uh, uh, wall so if you happen to go to use that bathroom with your neighbor you can talk to each other you can hear each other and you know, basically, just the old man use one half side, and the old woman use another half side. And uh, once in a while, peasants will come, dig them out, go down to the field, and it was so stinky, dirty, and full of worms in the summer. I was traumatized as a child to basically use that bathroom because when light bulb go busted, nobody cared to change the light bulb under communism no private property, everything owned by people, or you would call everything owned by the state. So nobody took initiative to take care of it. So at night, you don't, you're afraid of use that bathroom. And we have one water faucet. If water runs out, you're out of luck. And you have no water to cook and to clean. So you better build your own little water tank to reserve water. The electricity was not enough, always dark. And the floor was made from a mud. It was not concrete floor. It was mud floor that sometimes growing mushrooms, <laughs> but don't eat those mushrooms because it might be poisonous. Growing mushrooms. Oh my yes, the, our, our my oh dad's my uh, apartment, community housing, so-called rent free from the and his work factories and uh, grow mushrooms. And, and the water in the summer would get flooded. It was at lower point. So when, when, when it rains a lot in the summer, then flood can come in. So we had to all get up to um, stack up some bricks and to stop the water from coming. And, and it was truly a struggle. And, and also that uh, um, 
our neighbors just uh, could not even have a privacy. There's no privacy concept. So you, you door lock, we did not even have a door lock. The only thing to lock your door to protect your family is a little iron hook. So it's like uh, something easy to hook uh, there. But anybody just kick, can kick your door open. It was very scary for me as a child because we live in this crummy uh, neighborhood, all the because the lowest uh, working class in the city live, there were crimes, but we had uh, no weapons to defend ourselves. Um, so people know, but just run to, you know, get kitchen knives out if somebody, you know, come in as a criminal. And uh, sometimes I couldn't sleep at night because I would hear people running behind our place it was like a river or something, public river and the people screaming. And, but if the government, uh, like let's say if a police want to come in, um, you have to open the door and uh, they, they can lock the door, they can kick the door down, it's very easy. And But our teachers, principals, the communist block committee members all can come into home, just sit on your bed because we don't have bedroom, living room, it's just one, two room, right? Two room, they can just sit on your bed. So we have one table with some chair to eat and the two rooms, one room for my two brothers to sleep and one room for me to share that with my parents for 15 years, 15 years. And uh, in, I don't have a picture of it. It's, it, you know, it's gone now. And so that means we have an outdoor kitchen where we go to cook, we burn coal. So the coal that you put, you have to add on top of each other. And if they collapse, then you have no heat, no fire. You cannot cook that day. Then you'll be stuck and starving. You know, it's it's a very primitive uh, living condition. But but because I was born into mouse uh, regime, that uh, uh, we were supposed to see Kung Pao Yang say Long live Chiang Mai Mao every day, Long live Communist Party, because we're supposed to say grateful for some food. Do you know how much we ate? Do you have an idea how much food rationing coupon we got? Huh. Um, so I that's another not thing. A lot. No, I was I was really hungry child, and that, oh, my childhood memory was full of just hunger. You know, growling stomach, everything smell wonderful. You know, for some reason, when you're not hungry today, this food you don't smell as good as it used to be, uh, <laughs> right? So give me <laughs> yeah. example. Give me example. My 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 dad, uh, my mom worked for state factory six days a week. And you get the food rationing coupons and from the local government. That's based on your family size and also your parents' positions inside of the state factories. Hey, everybody work for government six days a week and uh, you don't have choice. If your mother, you want to stay home to babysit, to be with your children, no. Everybody got to work under communist um, country system. Uh, you are guaranteed a job. Doesn't matter you like it or not. You go to work, and your kids go to um, you know state factory daycares, and or family watch them for you. But it does not mean it's free. So we may my 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 parents could not even afford my baby brother's daycare. He he was one year old. So basically, I stay home to babysit him for a year. I was six. Well, that called child abuse today, right? I was six wow. to help my baby brother was an infant and it was too expensive for my parents to afford it. So they begged me to stay home and to say, hey, maybe you can put off school for a year. I wanted to go to school so bad because I, I know my parents were illiterate. That's why they cannot move up, get a promotion. They are proletarians, they're workers, but they got the least amount of food coupons and uh, very primitive living condition compared with uh, the officials, the higher position people. And uh, so what can I do? I cried and they bought me a ticket to go watch, uh, you know, Romania fighting Nazis or foreign movie supposed to be a luxury. So I went to watch a movie and decided I'm going to help my family do my duty. And I'm the oldest. And I'm, I, I never remember my childhood that much because I feel like I was treated as adult, always. So I stay home and to babysit my baby brother. I was kind of scared. And my neighbor who had a higher position in the state factories and they, the lady at home will boil 
a milk, like uh, using milk powder or, you know, boil your milk, that you smell so good. When you're hungry, you know, the even powder milk that smells so good. But we did not have a lot of jewelry to drink the powdered milk. It was too expensive for us. And uh, so we, you know, it, 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 it was a, uh, um, those years I learned that, uh, oh, people actually died from the 1958 to 61 during the three years natural disasters. Oh, it's like lots of people died. Of course, later I discovered and it was a uh, mouse central planning policy killed those people because, uh, you know, there was no food, enough food and mass filming happened. But I was told, oh, you know, we should say, we should say thank you to my mom because we have food to eat now. And, uh, you know, our life is better. And even though I was thinking, I'm hungry, I, I still want to eat, eat more food. And for people who never had to um, live like that, and I want to share this horrible stories that uh, we were so hungry. When I was babysitted by my grandmother, my two uncles were, we, we were trapped the rats. There were some rats running around in our courtyard, my, my grandma's courtyard. So they were trapped the rats. And uh, so basically then, you know, cook over the fire, you suck on the bones, not much meat. But uh, even that uh, ran out very fast. Everybody learned go to catch rats and then they're gone. <laughs> so you can tell today's Venezuela, people are eating all the cats and the cats ran out. I feel so sorry for them today, what's going on because it remind me what happened to us, you know, back then. Right. And under Mao. I have I have so many questions, but uh, I know I'll, let me try to keep them a little bit short because I know we got to cover other things. But I I just you know here's a thought I had you know I think a lot of tyrannical dictatorships, including communism, any communist dictatorships actually, especially communist dictatorships, a lot of them enjoy keeping a lot of their citizens uh, on a a level of subsistence, whether that is through um, limiting what they can read, whether that is through limiting the amount of food they can get. It's all about controlling their, limiting their ability to do things, to keep them dependent on the broader system overall, to keep them hooked to whatever cult of personality they have. In North Korea, it's Kim Jong-un. Uh, in, in, in China, it was Mao. I think, you know, now it's the CCP generally. Um, did you ever have any, you know, officers from the CCP, officers from the Maoist regime come to your house to check on you to make sure that you were following and doing exactly what they wanted did you do? How did they enforce, other than rationing, how did they enforce their uh, sort of rule onto you? And what did you experience in that regard? You're right. Um, all the Communist Party, Communists have one thing in common. They really don't care about their fellow citizens as human beings. They do come to our home, check on us, but then they never care about if you're hungry, if you have enough food. Those questions never come up, okay? Because uh, you are entitled to some coupon, you should be grateful. What do they come your home for is make sure you are on the same page with the regime with the state and with the communist party's policies and you are politically correct and you loyal to Chairman Mao and to the party. So when they do home visits, like from schools, I mean, all schools were government schools and they make sure and parents, kids are all on the same page. And they will ask you, then I don't think anybody ask how we feel about lack of food, lack of sanitary living conditions. They didn't care because most people live like that at that time. You know, maybe you wonder, uh, we were told to hate capitalism. We were told to hate the imperialist Americans, but we were told Taiwanese people were starving. But I, we, I was starving too. That just did not make sense. But, but we, I had no brain, I had no truth to verify, to say, what is going on outside of China? No, I, we, we had no press freedom, no free speech. So we just took whatever they told us. They will come to your home. And as I said, that's the one party control is from top down. 
top from Beijing to the provincial government, to the city government, to the county government, to your neighborhood block committees, all are Communist Party members, and they're not elected by people. So who do you think they care? They care about to please their top line political officials and cutters and communist bosses instead of their people because they're not voted by us. Why would they care? So they will come in and talk to you like this, you know, hold their, uh, always hold their hands like this and lecture you, lecture you, listen, listen, here's a party policy. What do you think about that? What are you doing that? And if, if somebody, some neighbor say something, not a political crack or report it to those people, oh, you'll be in trouble. It's very strictly, tightly controlled um, environment. I, I had two neighbors disappeared during the Cultural Revolution. And we're not supposed to talk about it. And when I'm trying to ask, what happened to those neighbors? My adults always say, shh, don't talk about it. There's a low rule of law. They just disappear, no fair trial, no family notification. You don't know what happened to them. You know the book, 1984, right? People of basically course, Orwell, live. Of course. Yeah, you live in terror. You had no idea. Even though, you know, geez, um, our living conditions were so bad and nobody cared. And, um, and if you get sick, then we had the government run clinic for you to go to. And it was always a uh, very, very um, dirty, and uh, sometimes had nines. And then it's not free; you had to pay. It's all myth. Oh, really? Oh, utopian under communism, everything's free. I just told you. Besides, my my parents' uh, uh, a family row house was rent free. We had to pay for doctor visits. We had to pay for state childcare. We had to pay for government schools. My parents got into debt for our three kids, government schools, tuition and books. And they always had to borrow money from a families to say, can I pay you back later? Because I got to pay for my kids schooling right now. All they promised were not kept. The utopian and never came, never came. And then instead we were propagandized every day. And imagine you wake up 6.30 in the morning, your whole neighborhood, your school is like a concentration camp. 6.30, loud big speakers come on and play revolutionary songs, read you the official party news and uh, go to school and uh, you know go to work. None of it to my mom chanting. And sometimes you will hear struggle sessions like like a, who is who is a, is a rightist is a, is anti revolutionary is a traitor then we have to you know chanting like a down you know this down that it was during cultural revolution it was totally just social political chaos or living in poverty and indoctrination I mean I did not know what to make of it I really did not know we just go by our day by day by day. As a child, I just remember, okay, I was hungry. I didn't care about, oh, I wear really you know, poor, dirty, like old clothing with patches on. Remember, you need to buy fabrics with government fabrics coupons. <laughs> they name it how much fabric you can buy to make a piece of new clothes for you. Because, uh, so make you wonder how Christian, how come six days a week people work for government? Where is the productivity? There's not enough supply of anything. You got the one government brand detergent or take color of your new clothes just like that after one wash. And uh, you get the one kind of toilet paper and we round up toilet paper because they were kind of expensive to buy. And uh, when I was little as a girl, I'm the only girl out of three children. You know, of course I was being selfish. I like to, you know, kind of keep couple of toilet papers for myself because I'm a girl, you know, I got to use toilet paper when I go small, small, you know, one. And uh, in the countryside, people cannot even have toilet paper for number two. Guess what did they use in Sichuan? Bamboo shoots. Use bamboo shoots to bamboo. scrape yourself. 
bamboo shoots, like little bamboo shoots, they, and they kind of cut it and make a smooth. And this, you scrape your butt after your number two, it's not really clean, but hey, when you did not have toilet paper, what do you do? You use bamboo shoots in the poor rural countryside. I had a family relative there. So that's what they did. Oh my God. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well you, you, know, you, know, I, you know, so I, I have got to ask you, you know, when I have more questions along this, but I want to make sure we can get other things as well. So just like, when did you finally realize, or when did you come to the idea that I can no longer take this and I'm going to well, go try to find a different place or a different life? When did you come to that realization? How did it start? It's lots of years, lots of years. Mao died when I was 12. So when he died, imagine this, you are told, long live to my mom every day for six days a week. You, you went to government schools and you were brainwashed and doctorate every day think Mao was God. And you say long live to my mom, 10,000 years, another 10,000 years. Can you imagine we never questioned that? We just thought he was God. He would never die. When you say double 10,000 years, double another 10, it's like he's gonna live one million years. Nobody ever questioned that. No. So he was really like our God. So when he died, I guess I had a little bit brain left still. I just could not believe it. Sure, my mom died. He was talking to me from sky when I was so brainwashed as a child. I saw him smiling at me. His smiling face arise from the fire, wood we burn. How could he die? That's when really I start to, of course, the beginning I was so sad. I was totally lost. I don't know what to believe anymore, but I also start to think about it. How, how did he die? Why did he die? Did, did, did somebody lie to us? What's going on? I start to question. I was always the best student, right? I was I was a mouse and young pioneer, wear a red scarf. I was part of a red guard. And uh, you know, I was class president and three married students and uh, chanting every day. So I start to say, oh, this does not sound right. Did, did anybody lie to us, lie to my generation? And my parents' generation, because everybody was sad, was lost. And uh, he died. Guess what? Only take another five years for the Communist Party to come out to say, Mao made a mistake. He was human. 10 years, Cultural Revolution was a mistake because our economy was just, uh, you know, basically collapsed. And, uh, but I did not have to wait for five years for me to go to college. Uh, when Mao died, 1978, 77 actually, Deng Xiaoping and started to open up on Chinese schools again. When Mao shut down schools, the only cultural revolution for young people to do political struggles, right? Five red against five black classes, and uh, they can have time to do whole full time struggle sessions. And later, Mao sent them to countryside for 10 years. I was lucky because I was a younger, I'm not like my uncle generation get sent to countryside, get re-educated by parents and stuck there for 10 years. And, and so I was 12, so then I started to go to school and the middle school, high school and the college opened 1977. I had a new dream. Oh, maybe I can find the truth. Maybe I can search for truth in college if I just learn about what happened during the Cultural Revolution. And during Mao's time, we were told, long live, long live. And, uh, but then I did not know what truth is. I did not find the truth in college either. So when I was 17, I went to law school in Shanghai. And, uh, and it's of course uh, centralized. Still all schools are controlled by government. Every department has a communist party committee. And uh, um, I thought if I study law, Maybe I could help China to become a society rule of law instead of rule of man. Like one, you mean like one man can do so much damages like that. And, uh, but I was told law is not for justice. 
the law is a tool for the party to use to govern the masses. I was lost again after a couple of weeks in college. Law school is like a four years college. I was 17. Why should I be able to live now then? I wanted to have a justice. I wanted to have a protection for regular citizens. But now they told me the law, the legal system, just a tool. It's a Soviet Union model. You are guilty until you prove yourself to be innocent. Who can prove yourself to be innocent against a powerful state? When one party controls all the prosecutors, all the law enforcement, all the military, and all the courthouses, you are a powerless individual citizen. So I become a very rebellious in college. I start to look for truth. You know, guess what? An 80s was best time actually in my life that time in China. And even compared with now, the 80s was the time for opening reforms and the cultural renaissance. And we had dancing parties. We had the foreign students and scholars come to our universities. And uh, we were talking about political reforms, not just economic reforms, to see what kind of country we would like to have. So I started to just see all the foreigners as my source of truth and information. So I started to go to dancing parties. I met some foreign and country exchange students. And then I will ask them with my very broken English, tell me about your country very slowly, right? You've got a French, your Holland, American students. And we had a parties with them. And we start to lay our hair down, you know, dance and to chant and with broken English. And I met an American student and he, um, told me to go visit him. He had something to show me from America. And I went to his dormitory. Remember, all the dormitories were guarded by guards. So when you go to specially visit a foreign student, you have to register. You have to sign on, sign in and sign out what you talk about. Your dormitory, your major, your name to keep track. What? Who is going to talk to foreigners? What? Wait, 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 so you have to tell them what you talked about. Yes, they want to know. Oh. So you better oh. be smart, right? Don't trust the system. Don't trust the authorities. Right. So at the beginning, I thought he was going to talk about, show me some art piece from America. So I put down art. Then later he read to me, you know, first paragraph in his pocket constitution about, you know, the first paragraph um, um, in the Declaration of Independence. You know, very slowly, my English wasn't good then we held those truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I could not understand that question. I had to ask him, I, I don't understand. He told me, you can be Chinese, a woman, yellow skin, and uh, but you are created by God, Lily. And you have this natural right as you individual. It's like, Dun! You know, think about your light bulbs came on, right? Oh, I have rights. I never heard of individual rights before. It's always workers' rights, peasants' rights, soldiers' rights, women's rights. Never about individual rights. What do you mean individual? It's me, me, by my own existence. That's that is that is beautiful. The fact that you were in a dictatorship that where you had seen a system go against your conscience, go against your rights constantly. And then a glimmer of light from America who was over there studying, took out the constitution and then planted that seed in your mind. And you just took that and you, something clicked. And so after it clicked- well, because after, what he said yeah. to me, because what yeah. he said to me is so powerful. And then I yeah. reflect my past life for like, I met him when I was 19. I reflect my life in the past 19 years. Yes, sir, yes, man, yes, teacher. What hairstyle you can have, how much food you can eat, what songs you can see, what dance you can do. And you could not date, dating was banned. You could not have a crush on a handsome boy and you gotta be loyal to this God, share my mouth and party is always right. 
Your teachers, your principals are always right. You, I think about the life I went through and I hear this new concept. It's like, hmm, you know, something is just opening up, can never shut off. So later I learned when I went back, I still talk about, I just refuse to register. I, I tell myself, I have rights. I know why they don't want me to go because they don't want me to talk about this important stuff that to open up my mind. So I was a stray rat. I know this lady will go to bathroom, will go to get a hot tea, like a, get a hot water. So I would just cheat. I would just run upstairs very quietly. And when she's not paying attention, she's gone temporarily. And I just, you know, tiptoe very quiet. And the that same thing you come down because I want to know a little bit more about America. Then we talk about the country system, the founding father's documents. You have a separation of powers. Not just one party is always right. Then you have a voting rights, all that bill of rights. I get to choose who I want to represent me to be my representative in the government. Then I have a free speech, freedom of religion, a free association, and fr you know all those bill of rights, especially, oh my God, I have a second amendment. Can you imagine that all Chinese are disarmed? And you're talking about this country, <laughs> right. people have right to bear arms. It's like, I mean, I never touched any guns in my entire 24 years in China. We were totally disarmed. You cannot even have some uh, knives. So the only thing you could protect yourself, we were told our kitchen choppers, you know, the big chopper used to chop the chickens when you have a Chinese <laughs> yeah. New Year, the Chinese yeah. cooking show, bang, bang, bang. That's <laughs> our weapon. We oh, know no. chopsticks will not work, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I will say that's the moment I open up my mind and my light bulbs came on. I start to question my authorities, even in law school. And uh, he put something into my head. If I have to leave China someday to escape all this, which country would I like to live? I could go to Europe, right, to study, to go to graduate school. But I say, hmm, I love this country, have a guaranteed right and uh, separate government who, you know, let the people to keep them limited and, and vote them in or vote them out. And, uh, you know, their powers are given by the people. It just, I love those concepts. So I say, this is the country I would like to go. And uh, I think uh, after that, when I become law school faculty, I realized I could not fulfill my dream in China to change China to a rule of law society. Um, because the one party rule, how can you have a rule of law when you have a dictatorship? So I figured out pretty quickly where other people were still trying to deal with it, right? Because when I become law school faculty member, five students out of 60 first class graduates, I got an offer to stay in Shanghai to be faculty member to also practice law part-time. And um, that reality kicked in. I was no longer a rebellious student going to my dancing parties, going to bonfire and escaping my curfew for 10 o'clock at night and doing all kinds of rebellious stuff. I couldn't do that anymore because I have a Communist Party boss in my department said, uh, you got to join Communist Party. You got to go to your political study every week because you are law school faculty. Your loyalty is lying with the party. You cannot even be independent or non-party member. So I was pressured and they put me into the party and then they watched me like a hawk for one year. So they watched me, was quiet during the political study meeting weekly. I was uh, no longer able to do kumbaya. Yes, yes, I support my light bulb came on, they don't turn off. But when I realized I want to go to the United States to leave China, how I'm going to flee that? Because without the party boss permission, you cannot go get a passport. 
they have to give you a piece of paper to apply for passport to travel, to go to abroad, to study. So I had to be that straight red again. I had to, you know, change my strategy. I went to studies. I bottled up my boss. Yes, yes, I support party. I, I support, I have to active participate. You cannot just go sit on there quiet. They can tell my eyes, from my eyes, I was not happy. I was challenging them silently. So I had to change the strategy. So I finally got, a, you know, seven trips to passport with their permission, two times to consulate. And, uh, but, but of course they asked me to sign a contract. The contract is that you promise to go back to China after you graduate school, even though I left, I got enrolled into graduate school by spending my own money and on my own time. But they told me, you come back, serve your country, or you need to sign this agreement. We're going to kick you out of party. OK. And second one is we're going to kick your personnel file to your hometown in Chengdu. Personnel file is like a household registration system. You are tracked where you're supposed to live. As a legal resident, you don't have freedom of movement. So you cannot just pack your bag and move from Chengdu, second tier city, to Shanghai, first tier city. It will take you years and years to change their status. And when your parents got married, you get a household registration. They're supposed to live in Chengdu in this neighborhood. You live there. You live there. You cannot just move to another province, another even city. So. I knew the consequences. If I don't go back, they're going to kick me file back to Chengdu. I will never be able to live, work as a legal resident in Shanghai, which I thought was an international commerce center, more open, more Westerners. I did not want to go to Southwest China, which is Sichuan Chengdu, next to Tibet, because it's just not so advanced. It's more backwards. And, you know, so I signed it. In order to leave, I sign it. I don't know where everything is now, Christian. I bet, I bet I could be hundred in my nightmare. My personnel file, all my records are back to Chengdu. And those records, by the way, it's a secret file. You and your parents are never allowed to see it. It's only shared by government agencies and by your future employers. You don't get to see it. You don't get to correct it. <laughs> You don't wow. belong to yourself. There's no self ownership. You have no right. personal sovereignty. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's my nightmare, I guess. They could be hunting me later. <laughs> so you went to graduate school in America? Yes, I went and, to UT Austin. And, and so you basically, when you went to graduate school, you didn't go back to China. You basically left China when you went to graduate school. Or did you go back to China after? Right, that? right. And people always ask me, oh, did, did your family get into trouble because of that? Uh, no, because what happened? Remember 1989 when Tiananmen Square massacre happened? And Bush was president at that time. He gave all the Chinese students in this country a refugee status. So you are talking about, about 300, 400,000 all Chinese in this country got a political refugee status. So they could not single me out because I stay here. So, right. so, so I was okay. And of course I um, married American citizen. And then when you get married as American citizen, you can get also conditional green card, conditional permanent resident status. Then two years later become a, um, like a permanent resident. Then five years later, if you pass your American civics citizens test, then you can become US citizen. So, so the first time I become citizen, I think it was 1995 because I married to my husband, 1990, and he's from Texas. Imagine I met him the first night in Austin, Texas. Oh, that's adorable. That's so wonderful. I know I could not even speak English very well, but, but, but we dated for 18 months and he, he was, uh, you know, teaching me about American culture and language and, and he was very patient. And I always had to write down what he said go look at my dictionary. And the people always say, how did you become so liberty-minded? Also thanks to him. He, he told me, me but, but it take me 20 years, 20 years though, to really get rid of my educational indoctrination, you know, brainwashing from China. Because I come to this country and when, when my English got better, um, 
I was fighting against my government, but I did not have a foundation, a concept, ideology. I just want government leave me alone, right? But after I came to this country, I was still big, big government believer. Oh, government should do this. Just like to this, lots of people, government should do that. It's like government is the solution to our problems. 2008, I woke up because uh, my husband told me to read some books. I realized how many lies in my lives they gave to me in China and uh, government is not a solution. Government is right. a problem. So yes. I become more and more libertarian in 2008. That's 20 years in this country. <laughs> 20 yeah. years I woke up. That's how long it will take you if you are indoctrinated all your life. You might take a lifetime to reverse that. Now, when you came to America, you, you mentioned you only had a hundred bucks. You didn't have very much when you came to America. So how did you survive in the first year or two or so of you being in America? Well, I did not make much money as a faculty member. And my parents actually were in terrible shape financially they're always in debt. So when I become a faculty member worked in Shanghai for three years, I sent partial my salary to my poor working parents in Chengdu every month because I want to thank them to support me go through four years college. You know, my dad sent me food money every month. And uh, so I did not save much money. And uh, so when I wanted to leave China, I had lots of good Friend, I'm, I was always sociable, outgoing, so I made lots of friends in college. Some are lifetime friends and some I don't know where they are today, probably in all over the world too. And I said, uh, can I raise 10 bucks? Can I borrow 10 bucks? 10 bucks, 10 bucks. Remember Chinese dollar, Chinese yuan to America at that time is like a one to five or something. One US dollar equal to five or six Chinese yuan. So I had to borrow a lot to make it $100. And uh, so I basically to say, hey, 10 bucks here, 10 bucks there, I will pay you back. I, I, I will make good money. I will become rich. I was confident I will make it. I will pay you back with the interest. So five $20 bills when I come to this country. It was very funny, Christine, when I arrived at an airport, and transfer in, in Denver, I had to go fly to Austin. And the American guy saw me pulling my heavy suitcase without the wheels. And I was struggling, you know, I had one suitcase, I was struggling because no wheels, right? And he came in to offer me like a five bucks or something. I did not understand English. I said, oh, no, 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 thank you, thank you. He asked me to use that five dollars to go get a buggy, rent a buggy, and then put my suitcase there so I don't have to pull so hard. And, but I said, oh, no, 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 thank you. I did not understand. I was pulling, pulling because uh, I just did not know there's an other solution, right? And uh, that was very nice of, you know, my first impression of this random stranger offer me money. It's like, why did he offer me money? I was still being a very traditional Chinese. I, I, I couldn't communicate with him. So I did not touch my five $20 bills until I got to my destination out in Texas. And uh, um, of course, uh, my sponsor, American sponsor, uh, a professor in UT Austin, and um, picked me up and uh, took me to his home. So in exchange to have a free housing because I could not afford to live on my own, I cooked, I cleaned. And my neighbor next door, which was my future, actually mother-in-law, Jiang's mom. So my sponsor said, let's go meet, go meet your dean of the School of Social Work in your graduate school. I said, I'm too tired, I had the air sick, I was throwing up and I'm tired. He said, no, 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 Every, everybody is waiting for you. So when I reached my um, sponsor's house in Austin, Texas, and uh, John and his brother came out and to, you know, to take my suitcase to my sponsor's house. And my mother, you know, at the door said, welcome to Austin, Texas. Here's my garden, a one red rose from her garden. Oh, I just feel like she was just so nice and kind of motherly like, and uh, everybody was so nice. And uh, so they invited me to go to their house. They said, well, our neighbor, your sponsor told us you love ice cream and the watermelons. That was in May, Texas was pretty hot. And I had to be polite because uh, 
you know, of course I love to ice cream and watermelon in Shanghai was so hot, there was no air conditioning and humid. You know, but in Austin, I was air sick, but in order to be polite, I didn't know how to communicate. I, I ate everything they offered to me just to be polite, even though my stomach was hurting. You know, the funny story that I said, geez, John, I had a diarrhea for two weeks. And it's not because of watermelon ice cream, it's because when you change your stomach in a new country, you change your soil, your cleaning yeah. system. It could be in the water I drink, just not used to it. So. So I, I took all my Chinese medicine with me come to this country after two weeks diarrhea, my stomach has changed. I was so healthy for the entire like uh, first year, right? I didn't need those Chinese medicines. I just threw them away. Yeah. <laughs> so I so I paid my bills, uh, you know, live cheaply until I got them. Um, I did get my research assistantship in graduate school. And uh, that's what my um, um, dean said. I got your job as I, R, I, R, A. Oh my, just like my heart was so heavy, <laughs> worried about how to pay bills. And like, it's like, oh, oh thank yeah. God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got a job. I said, I don't know what to do. My English is bad. She said, uh, I'm a scientist. You just check numbers for me. Oh, so I paid in-state yeah. tuition. Wow. Not a great international student. Wow. Rate. Wow. You had a lot of, you had a, you, you were very, very blessed. Oh my gosh. You were. Very blessed. I, I wonder, you know, it's like a destiny. I met my wow. husband first night and yeah. I got a job first night. I came over from China, $1,200 in debt, borrow $100. Yeah. It's wow. like, a, you know, <laughs> my mom said, Oh, Buddha bless you. Buddha bless you. And my said, God, God bless you. You know, God sent your husband to you and your husband's family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah oh, I, I'm so blessed. Ever since the first night I come to this country, that's why I love America. Yeah. So after graduate school, uh, first, what did you go to graduate school for? And school of social work. And, okay. And specialization is the um, administration and the planning. Okay. And so after graduate school, did you ever go, did you go back to China or did you stay in America and, and build a, build a family? Well, and, and here's a funny story. Uh, my husband and I, we got engaged where I both are in graduate school and uh, my family said, uh, bring him home. We check him out and give you approval. First hmm. of all, I don't need approval. I'm an only cousin. <laughs> I know I'm the most uh, educated. But they just want to make sure it's a family courtesy. You let them check out your future spouse. But I told my family, I can't. I'm an international student. If I take them back to China as a, I'm still a foreign student, what if I cannot come back to the United States? My years are years nightmare. Like I was trapped in China. I could not, I could not get out. So I'm not going to take that risk. So I asked my family to bless me to marry myself out. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had a wonderful godmother in Austin, Texas. So she act like my mother. I have my American sponsor act like my father. So they gave me away at my wedding when I married John. So after I got married, I had get this piece of paper, conditional green card status. So I was confident if I go back to China, nothing can stop me from coming back. Right. So that's what, yeah, so we were in graduate school and uh, and, and I, I, I think I graduated already, but John's still in graduate school. So that's the first time I took him, my husband, um, to China to visit. Everybody just loved him. And um, then we come back and uh, he continued to finish graduate school. And uh, I was pregnant with our first child. So, so I worked part-time for raised children family, two boys in Wyoming and uh, with my master's degree. And later when John got a job with Hughes Aircraft, they sent us to Hong Kong for two years. So I know that was a great experience. Wow. In Hong Kong, I love the Hong Kong free market. No, you know, you know how they file tax return? A postcard. Really? Wow. A postcard. Wow. Flat income tax, 15% with a couple of deductions, boom, send out. And uh, no sales tax. So I, everybody work hard, have their own little business and uh, one of the most free market in the world. 
everybody wants to come to Hong Kong to start business, make money. I met the Pakistanians, the Indians, Filipinos, Thai people, lots of British there, you know, working. It was like a little international city. It was, it was great. And I got a first job in an international trading company and, uh, and to be some corporate manager between Hong Kong and China. And I learned a lot in those two years in Hong Kong. And it's so, so sad to say where Hong Kong yeah. is today. Oh, oh, I agree, and we can talk about that a little bit, a little bit later, because it's it's very, it's very, it's actually, it's, funnily, it's personal, it's personal for me, and I'll, I'll tell you about that later. Um, but, um, so, did your personnel file ever affect you when you went back to China after a while, or, or did it ever, like, did it ever, like, you know, affect you from being able to travel? Because eventually you didn't go back to China, like you stayed in America. So did it ever affect you? Or yeah, but the you? reason I gave it to you because Bush is a blanket, political refugee. Ah, okay. Status. Yeah. So that did not affect me, all my okay. family. Yeah, thank okay. goodness for that. I did go back to China a few times and my last time was 2015. Okay, okay, thank goodness, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, and so, you know, you, so you did this international trading company thing and when you finally settled in America, what, you know, how did things go? I, I hear that things went quite well for you. How did, how did things go? You, you got a well, taste to of summarize, the... Uh, yeah. Right, right. To summarize that uh, after we come back from Hong Kong, it was 1998. So my husband came back to Houston Aircraft who sent us to Hong Kong and then purchased by Raytheon, um, defense contractor Raytheon. So we come back to Denver and uh, we bought a house and I got a job also. So we both were working. When I was pregnant, about to have our third child, our last child, a daughter, and, and John and I, we, we settled down in Parker, Colorado, moving to the house, our you know first, uh, um, first the daughter's home, actually our American dream house, because I made sure we have like uh, enough toilet for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> like four oh, yeah. and a half beds, yes. <laughs> of course. I, you know, it's like, oh, no more fighting <laughs> over toilet because I, that just hit me so hard. And so I, I was not political, Christine. I was uh, working, raise family, pay bills. And uh, in 2000, I got laid off uh, by a, a company I worked for, telecommunication. Remember telecom bubble in the, yes. in the you know, yes. that time? I, I, I got a pink slip. They asked me to leave that day, walk to the door. I was so devastated. What I'm gonna do now, my American dream, you know, come to a halt. It's like, what should I do? I just remembered that I always wanted to be a self-employed, be my own boss, pay my own bills. So after this terrible experience, I was saying, I was thinking maybe I should start my business and to be consultant with my bilingual, bicultural background experience, international experience in business in Hong Kong. Maybe I should make, a, um, make it okay because I have law degree from China and I couldn't do consulting. And so I started my own business when I got laid off. But for first eight years, I was not profitable. And the project come and go, it's not consistent. After you add all your expenses, you are not profitable. And that was focused on raising three kids with my husband. So, so my husband's income was the only source of income we had until 2008. 2008, when every day you hear on TV, my English got better. Actually, during those eight years time when I was laid off, I had the time to get into involved in politics. I read more. Oh, really? I read those books. Yes, my, I read those books my husband recommend to read. And I got involved with our HOA because I said, well, since I have time now, I'm an American citizen, I should participate in this uh, democratic grassroots process. Why HOA is raising my fee every year, right? I'm going to get involved. <laughs> so I got involved. I ran for board and later my kids were kind of doing some things in public schools I did not like. You know, so hard for my two boys in this public school uh, where we live. I put them out, put them into charter school. When I went to a one presentation, so, oh, charter school, parents control. I love that concept. Parental control, that's right, it's very dear to me, right? I had a school right. choice. And I'm taking my kids out, put them in charter school. I got involved on the board. I even become chairwoman one year. 
I had to fire a principal. I gave her a call to say, we're not going to renew your contract. Oh my. <laughs> it was a very, wow. it was a very empowering experience. 